It's fall 2021 and we are once again greeted with new phone announcements from Apple and Google. Apple has the new A15 Bionic chip and iOS 15. Google has the new Android 12 and their new CPU chip for Pixel 6 called Tensor. What is quite interesting are the many privacy changes that have been incorporated into iOS 15 and I'll explain what those are as well as discuss if they're good or bad changes. The new A15 Bionic chip from Apple and the Tensor from Google actually have some future privacy implications as well, though I'm not sure what the immediate impact is. So things are moving in the privacy front with these phones. The question is whether they're moving in the correct direction. Or maybe they just want to make us think they're moving in the correct direction. Well, let's find out. Stay right there. When you need better search results like those from Google, but don't want the Google tracking, check out privacy search engine startpage.com. It does not collect or share any of your personal data so you can search anonymously. My company offers a VPN service, Bytes VPN, de-Google phones, VPN routers, and now we offer a Brax Mail email service. These products are made to protect you from big tech and their tricks to profile us. If you're interested in them, they are on my app, BraxMe. The link is in the description. To be frank, some of the changes in tech client appear to be good. I have a brand new iPad mini here running iOS 15 and an A15 Bionic chip, and I have been able to test out some new features that are privacy focused. This is a bit refreshing after the mixed signals this year. Apple, of course, added the Apple AirTag technology, which means more tracking of each phone is now possible just by your position near an Apple AirTag. Additionally, this year, Apple started to analyze your image content on your device. Supposedly, it is to identify illegal images on your device, but truly, it is bothersome in terms of the overreach. It introduces a technology called Neural Hash that can be used theoretically to track anything on a device that could be used by a thought police. And for both Apple and Google, I see the same dichotomy. There are moves to improve privacy, then there are counter moves to eliminate it. This is not as disorganized as it seems. It's actually well thought out, but it doesn't change the dangers associated with these devices. Fortunately, whatever their hidden motives are, the recent changes have positive effects to our privacy. So we'll take it. First, let's talk about the new chipsets. The A15 Bionic from Apple and the Tensor from Google really have things in common. By the way, most Androids will still be using the Snapdragon and the flagship from other companies will be using the Snapdragon 888. But the new Tensor chip will be used on the premium Pixel 6. Apparently, Google will start differentiating features that can be supported by higher-end processors versus the lower-end, so that will come later. On the Apple side, just because iOS 15 is out doesn't mean your device will get all this new tech. I have an old iPad Mini Gen 2, and that is no longer covered. Support for that ended at iOS 12, which is fortunately right before contact tracing was added. Anyway, back to the high-end processors. These new processors have a promise, and it's stated in the promotional material. The promise is that some of the AI features that used to be done in the cloud will at some point be moved to the phones. And here, they're primarily talking about voice recognition or speech to text. Currently, this works by sending your voice over the internet to Apple or Google, and then HQ processes the video and sends it back. The reason this occurred was that the computational power required to do local voice recognition wasn't there yet. Typically, you'd need a PC-level performance to do local voice recognition. Now, Apple, since a few years back with iPhone 10, already moved the facial recognition to the phone, which, although scary sounding, is actually a safer move. Doing facial recognition on the device rather than in the cloud protects us from centralized control of facial recognition. Google's Pixel 4 also gave the power of facial recognition locally to the device. With these new chips, and when voice recognition is actually moved locally, 
the dangerous transfer of our voices to and from HQ will end. The problem, of course, is that the number of devices with these new chips is still small, being a new model, so I don't know when local voice recognition will actually be in effect. Will they turn it on on a per-device basis? Not clear. At the moment, I'm going to assume it's a promise for the future and not yet in operation. I like it though, it's a move that is good for us. And believe it or not, it is also good for Apple and Google since they don't have to support the voice recognition infrastructure in the future. Less servers needed and less internet bandwidth, so lower cost for them. The way voice recognition is currently done is one of the biggest security and privacy leaks that I've discussed in my speech AI video. Hopefully some years from now, this will be eliminated. Amazon Echo, of course, is still doing the voice recognition in the cloud, so this is not some global solution with all of big tech. Facebook has threatened voice recognition for many, many years now, and fortunately hasn't gotten that far yet. In theory, they can use the phone hardware for voice recognition in the future, which would be a safer version. By the way, the new Tensor chip from Google is only slated for the Pixel 6. So even the new Pixel 5a will not have it. It's been reported that the cheaper Pixel models will stick to the Snapdragon going forward. Because of this, it is not completely clear how a voice recognition technology change could be supported if very few devices will be capable of handling it. So to state this again, only the Pixel 6 and a future flagship will have Tensor. Back to facial recognition for a moment. This, by the way, is a new iPad mini with no face ID. On this Apple ID, Apple restored the Touch ID, which is now the power switch. Really convenient. I've never been a fan of Face ID, but it is interesting that it's not included on a brand new iPad device. Now let's talk about the operating systems, iOS 15, and do a bit of comparisons with Android. There were a slew of changes in iOS 15 that were all focused on privacy, and nothing at this level with Android 12, though some of the features already existed with prior Androids. Let's talk about Hide My Email, iCloud Private Relay, and MAC Address, randomization. The first two features are part of the paid iCloud features which are now called iCloud Plus. If you're not paying for iCloud you will not get access to these. So if you're paying for even the lowest level iCloud storage at 50 gigabytes which is 99 cents you will get all these features. Let's start with hide my email. Android doesn't have an equivalent to hide my email and actually email tracking is much more intensive on Google since you're forced to use Gmail for any Google device. What exactly is Hide My Email and what is it used for? Well, you can't use it for anything Google because as I already said, Google forces you to use their Gmail. So you're stuck on Google platforms. Neither can you use this with anything Apple since for Apple you have to use your Apple ID which is your regular email. What it is useful for are the third parties like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and so forth. To these entities, you can sign up with a different randomized email address provided to you by Apple. Whenever you're on a website that asks for an email address, you can tap on a new option on iOS, which will create a new address for you. What will happen then is that from that point on, any email from the newly made email address will be forwarded to your current email address. So this is for receiving email only and for the purpose it is designed for, which is for app and website signups, it is a good option. You cannot use this to send mail using the randomized email address. It's receive only. Now obviously the fact that the old address is linked to the new address is very well known by Apple. So this is a consistent behavior in all of these new features. It can successfully hide you from the opposition like a Facebook, but it can never hide you from Apple. I'll keep coming back to this later. In general though, for people that haven't done any kind of email isolation strategy that I've talked about in other videos, this is a good thing. It adds some segregation from the dreaded contact list that all your friends have been uploading to social media platforms and maybe even to Apple itself. 
So as long as the entity you're trying to protect yourself against is not Apple or Google, then this is very useful. Apple promises to just forward your email and not read it. Does it matter? For the purpose of which it is used, which is for app logins, I don't think that's material. They can spy on it all day and it won't have anything interesting if it's used for what it's intended for, app login authentication. That's a very limited application. So no problem with this. If you're on iOS, you should use it if you want. Interesting though, that it would have no effect on Google. For app logins on Google, I would suggest alternative Gmail accounts that are not used for real communications, just dedicated app logins only. Unfortunately, it means splitting up the Apple side and the Gmail side, so I'd rather just put everything on Gmail and not use hide my email. If you're on Android, this solution is the same thing. Just use a new Gmail account, though you have to remember another email instead of Apple tracking it for you and directing it to a single inbox. The next feature is the iCloud Private Relay. This is basically a proxy server. You can turn it on on iCloud and all your network traffic is redirected to the iCloud Private Relay provider. Now, the way it is explained, the Private Relay provider exit node which shows the final IP address, is not Apple, but some other partner. Maybe so they can claim being hands-off at examining the traffic. This, by the way, is not the same as a VPN. A VPN gives you an encrypted tunnel to the server. The purpose of private relay is to change your IP address. So I equate that to a proxy server function. Though Google has no private relay option like this, Google began offering a VPN service as well. Though I would never suggest to anyone to ever use a Google VPN. Not a smart thing to do. But a VPN has a similar result. Websites will not be able to track IP addresses since the final IP address will not be unique to a location or the individual. In the absence of a VPN, this is a good thing. Compared to LTE data though, which is already using a pool of IP addresses, it doesn't achieve anything more. This is really useful only for those on a home network with a DSL connection and that's where the IP address has to be hidden since it can point to an exact location. In any case, the more people use a feature like this private relay or a VPN, at some point the company is doing reverse IP lookup databases which sell our locations with IP addresses will start to have bad data. So this is another nail in the coffin to third-party tracking. Less and less third parties will be able to match an IP address to an exact location, which is excellent. In many ways, Apple sounds like it's reading from my privacy protection playbook. These moves are generally good, though I will have a very strong caveat later on. If you have an iCloud Plus account, yes, enable this and start using it. It will be a good thing, at least against third-party tracking. The next feature that has been added to iOS this year has been MAC address randomization. Actually, this was added on iOS 14. MAC address randomization was also included since Android 10. First, some basics of what a MAC address is and why and if this matters. All network connected devices such as Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and a wired Ethernet port all have a network identifier called a MAC address. MAC addresses are unique. They're assigned to manufacturers and they're basically a network serial number. In the past, MAC addresses have been used to identify a specific device on the network since they're part of the hardware. A network administrator could allow a device with a given MAC address, remove a device, or a parent could put some internal limitations on a device based on a MAC address. Well, the new phone features will start to obscure this now. In fact, MAC address randomization is now available on iOS, Mac OS, Android, and Windows. And there was a long existing utility called Mac Changer to change it on Linux. The reason this became an issue in the last few years is because Zucking Zuckbook decided that they wanted to track other devices on the network. So this is like a direct slam to Zuck from the other big tech. 
ZuckBook was recording MAC addresses of devices on the same local area network. This could then be used to identify the presence of the device on some other network and can then be used to see who's meeting with whom and who's at Walmart versus Target. In other words, it was a form of contact tracing being used by Facebook. Because so many people use Facebook, basically Zuck turned every Facebook app into a spy app looking for MAC addresses nearby and making connections of people. So if a MAC address is spoofed, the data Facebook captured would theoretically be different. And since so many devices now have MAC address randomization, presumably Facebook will eventually give up tracking this MAC address. Now, before I leave the MAC address randomization subject, let me clarify the limitations of what Apple and Google are doing. Basically, the randomization occurs only once during the first connection to the Wi-Fi device. So if you're connecting to three Wi-Fi routers, each connection will be given a MAC address which will stay put unless you change or forget the network. This works fine against the Facebook threat since if you log into Starbucks, the MAC address will be different from the one when you're logged in at your house. But this does not stop MAC address tracking. First, all devices emit a radio frequency probe signal that can be tracked on the airwaves. This probe signal is sent over Wi-Fi and Bluetooth hardware and is sent with a MAC address, your real MAC address. The probe signal is prior to connecting to any network. Anyone with a radio can listen to your phone identifiers and establish a presence nearby. The Bluetooth beacon is what is used for contact tracing. And the Wi-Fi version can be used for security tracking of devices. Both can have a long range. This threat is not connected to Facebook, but it can clearly be used for contact tracing by other parties. Now, fortunately, contact tracing didn't really progress in the last couple of years, though the tech was added, which I'm glad about. But it's scary what they could have done with this. So to summarize the issue of MAC address randomization, this can beat the attacks from a Facebook, but someone can still tell if your device is close by, and that's why it's used for contact tracing. So only part of this MAC address threat was eliminated. Again, let's summarize these new privacy features. Hide my email. Okay, Facebook will no longer be able to track email by contact list. iCloud privacy relay. Okay, Facebook will no longer be able to identify locations based on IP address. MAC address randomization. Okay, Facebook will no longer be able to track relationships based on MAC address connections. It's really funny. It's almost like Tim Cook targeted Facebook with all these security features. In addition, since iOS 14, Apple also announced features relating to the advertising ID on the phone to make that default to off. Again, more anti-Facebook targeting. But to be honest, when I received the iPad unit, it had advertising identifiers on. I had to manually turn it off. So maybe they've changed their mind on that. The point though is that there is a clear demarcation of lines here relating to data. Apple has drawn a line in the sand that says, Zuck you, Zuckbook. This is our data, not yours. Google has done the same. So if you look at this, What's the big picture? What's happening? Is Apple really doing the good thing with privacy? And here's the rub. This is the consistent thing with both Apple and Google. They are doing things to benefit themselves. This is not really necessarily for our benefit, but at least we win a little bit this time. Google, to remind you, was starting to implement the Federated Learning of Cohorts or Flock and the intent of that was to obscure IP addresses and browser fingerprinting and severely limit cookie tracking. This would make it very difficult for a Facebook to track you outside of Facebook, which was the overreach they had been doing for years. Additionally, third-party advertising firms would also be affected. They can no longer track you with browser fingerprinting if Google manages to complete this project. Now, this tracking doesn't end just because Apple and Google makes these moves. 
To repeat what I said, it's basically a line in the sand drawn by Apple and Google to third parties that say, this is our zucking data. You will not get it for free. Google will continue to track you forever, but they will sell the data instead using this flock concept. They will sell identities of cohorts where Google routes the advertising messages to Android users, similarly for Apple. But no direct tracking. Apple and Google will have a tight control over their own networks. So what does this mean in a big picture sense? What is really happening sometimes appears as a good thing, but has some really bad side effects. The bad thing is that control over the data is now being centralized within Apple and Google itself. The data collection never stops. It's just controlled by the true owners of the phone. You don't really own your phones. You just pay for it. But Apple and Google will choose to do what they want. Apple chooses to pass network activity to track AirTags using your phone Bluetooth and your Wi-Fi, even though the AirTags are not yours. Side effect? Your own location is tracked. Apple locks location down for every app that you choose. But side effect? Your own location continues to be tracked since there is no option to turn off Apple's own location tracking called Wi-Fi scanning. iMessage encryption stops third parties from reading your messages. But it doesn't stop Apple since your encryption keys are kept on iCloud. Emails are hidden from third-party apps, but of course, a map of random emails to your real email exists, and it is your Apple ID and linked to your credit card. And of course, Apple can read iCloud email and Google can read Gmail. Google implemented a feature called Private DNS. This feature was intended to hide DNS queries from being intercepted by ISPs to track the websites you visit. Private DNS involved encrypting the DNS queries with TLS. The problem is that now on every Android, Google has centralized the DNS. By default, all Androids use private DNS, which means Google can see every DNS request. This again is consistent. Lock out access to external players and keep the data internally. So newer phones are more locked down from being accessed by external parties, but never locked down from access by Apple and Google. In fact, the new A15 Bionic chip would make neural hash function even faster, meaning the ability to identify particular images on your iPhone. More thought police capability in the future. So where do I stand with purchasing these new phones in fall 2021? Personally, I'm staying away from any phone from Apple and Google. They're still dangerous and will continue to be dangerous. The data collection within the ecosystem never stops, though external access is more limited. However, I don't have the same feelings of restrictions on non-phone devices. I no longer use an iPhone, though I was on that ecosystem for a long time. As many of you know, I use a de-Google phone, so that's what I take with me when I'm mobile. But use of a Mac OS, Windows, or even iPads at home really present a more limited risk to us. You just have to do a few different things. Because these devices are not mobile, their sensors are limited, and they don't have a record of every place you've been to. You can limit the identity tracking on a computer by not using the same identity. Windows, for example, does not need an identifier like a Microsoft ID. Mac OS can function fine as long as you don't match it to an iPhone and you can monitor what it sends to Apple. And on a computer, you just implement what I talk about in my video on browser isolation. An iPad that doesn't travel has very limited data to be captured. So it is not necessary to forsake all new tech. It's just be smart about it. Most of the tracking, perhaps 80% of it, is done on a phone mobile device. Proper choice of a mobile device can keep you safe. At the moment, nothing beats a de-Google phone for safety, and it is refreshing to know that no one is centrally collecting my data on it. Just a general caveat for all. Unfortunately, an iPhone can never be disconnected from Apple. A Google Android can potentially be disconnected from Google, which is a process I call de-Googling. You cannot de-Apple an iPhone. In the end, I'm seeing less third-party spying on iPhone but continued and increased surveillance by Apple. Google is still Google. I'm on the platform odyssey.com. 
I'm now one of the top creators on there. Just for insurance, in case I get the platform, please follow me there using the link in the description. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, then it really helps to build this privacy movement if you subscribe to this channel and hit that notification bell. Thank you for watching and see you next time. Thank you.